Father, we thank you for this opportunity to break open your word. And Father, we just pray that you would once again demonstrate your almighty power by using this broken messenger to communicate a message of healing to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. The single most well-known, most popular sermon of all sermons ever preached in the history of mankind, you'll be shocked to know, did not come from me. Just kidding. I bet you know who preached the most popular the most famous, well-renowned sermon in all of history. It was a man by the name of Jesus over 2,000 years ago. And you may be encouraged to know we actually have the transcript of that very sermon in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Yes, it is a long sermon. And in this sermon, Jesus himself covers just about every essential life topic all in this one singular sermon. So if in the past you've thought my sermons have been long, brother, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> this is a long sermon that Jesus preached. And then at the end of this sermon, much like pastors do today, Jesus decides to conclude or land his sermon by telling a little story. And here's the story that Jesus told, and I want to share this. This is a new translation. It's called the, the RJPV. That is the Rev. Jeff paraphrased version of this story. Okay? It goes a little something like this. Once upon a time, there were these two dudes... I told you it was a paraphrase. Once upon a time, there were these two dudes. And both of these dudes were home builder dudes. And one day, both of these home builders decided that they were going to build themselves a nice new home. And they did. They each built their own nice new home, but... They each built their nice new home on two completely different foundations. Home builder dude number one built his home on solid rock. That was the foundation upon which he built, solid rock. Now, home builder number two also built a nice new home. However, he did not build his home on solid rock. He chose as his foundation... Shifting sand. Now, I just have to confess, before we go any further, for some reason, every single time I read this story or I talk about this story, in the back of my mind, the children's story about the three little pigs always pops up. <laughs> and them building their house, right? Only for the story that Jesus is telling, it's not the big bad wolf that blows and knocks the house down. It's these huge storms, that come. These massive uh, rains and floods come and, and, and it slams into both of these houses. And when this happened, Jesus in the story says that home builder dude number two's house that was built on solid rock stood strong. And his house was able to withstand the storms of life. But home builder number two, when the, state, the same storms came and hit his house that was built on shifting sand, of course, we all know, it completely collapsed. And then after telling this story, Jesus pauses for a moment as if to say, and in conclusion, and this is what we read. This is Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Everyone who hears these words of mine, in other words, uh, for us, that would be the Bible. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like that wise man who built his house on the rock. 
Now, let me just reaffirm your suspicions that I do not have the skills or the ability to stand up here today and look you in the eye and say, friends, I have seen it. I have been in contact with God Almighty and I know every single bad thing that is going to happen to you from this day till your last. That is not a gift I have or want. I can't do it. That I do not know, but I do know this. Storms will come into your life. Emotional storms, health-related storms, relational storms, financial storms. Notice in the story that Jesus told, the storm hit both home builder dudes. Neither one of them had a get out of storm free card. They both had to face the storms that came into their lives, and so will you, and so will I. And when those storms come, if our lives are not built on the solid rock of God's word, then everything falls apart. If your life is not built on the unwavering, unchanging word of God, when the storms crash, you will fall apart. You need something solid, something unchanging. You cannot build your life upon relationships. You cannot build your life on the opinions of other people. You cannot build your life on the speculation of current culture. You, again, must build it on the unchanging word of God. And I hope, I hope you're able to sense this genuine urgency in my voice because this is so profoundly important for all of us. If you're already in a stormy season of life, you're already on the inside nodding and going, yeah, that's right. And if you're not yet in a stormy season of life, now's the time to get prepared. You batten down the hatches and get prepared before the storm comes. So let's begin, let's begin to address the question of how. How do I build my life on the Bible? How do I build my life on God's ultimate truth? Well, let's return to Matthew 7, 24, and let's look at it one more time. Everyone who hears, that's where we're going to start. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like that wise man who built his house on the rock. So building block number one, really basic building blocks today. Building block number one, I receive it with my ears. In other words, we're just talking about hearing the word of God, listening to God as he speaks to you. For example, every time you hear a pastor preach a message, every time you hear a study on the radio, every time you listen to a Bible-related podcast, you are building your faith on the solid rock of his word. In fact, congratulations, you are already doing step number one. You are listening to the word of God being taught. Well done. So we start by hearing the word of God. That's a good way to begin to build your faith. But if that's the only way that his word is coming into your life, you will not grow very much. In fact, did you know that the average person will forget 95% of what they have heard within 72 hours? Did you know that? You probably knew it and forgot, right? That's why I really think it's a good idea for us to take notes on Sunday morning, and I know many of you do. If you don't take notes, that means by Wednesday, you've forgotten everything you heard on Sunday. So hearing is a good way of getting the word of God into our lives, but if we forget 95% of it, we need more building blocks, right? So let's look at the second building block. Building block number two, again, really basic. I read it with my eyes. 
I receive it with my ears and I read the Bible for myself. I cannot build my faith simply listening to other people who have themselves studied the Bible. I have to read the Bible for myself. Let's look at James chapter 1. Pretty direct, to the point, no mincing words here. Don't merely listen to the word. In other words, yeah, you're supposed to listen to it, but you can't stop there. You don't just listen, right? Don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. You're deceiving yourselves because you're going to forget it. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says, and I love this, it's like a man who looks at his face in a mirror, and I just, I love this analogy, this, this analogy of a person who looks in the mirror, they see their reflection, they see exactly what's wrong, and then after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. <laughs> Isn't that great? Can't you just imagine somebody doing that? Can't you just imagine that kind of thing happening on a Sunday morning? We hear a good message. We're moved by the message. And then we move to the restaurant, and someone asks, what was the message that moved you? And we can't remember. <laughs> now, what's really embarrassing, if you're the one that preached that message in your lunch, you can't remember. <laughs> but he says, he looks in a mirror, sees his reflection, immediately forgets what he looks like, but he doesn't stop there, because here's the opposite of that, Okay? But the man who looks intently, and we'll come back to that phrase, looks intently. The man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, notice the Bible sets you free, and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed. He will be blessed. He will be blessed in what he does. How many of you would say, I want to be blessed? We all want to be blessed, right? And that is why we're doing this series. We want you to be blessed. We know you want to be blessed. We want you to be blessed. I want you to be blessed in every area of your life. I pray that God opens up the floodgates of heaven and blesses you financially, relationally, blesses you in every way possible. And the good news is the Bible gives us a pathway to blessing. The Bible says if you'll do these five things, you will be blessed. And this is not a formula that I came up with. This is not the prosperity gospel. This is just interpreting what God has told us. And we've already talked about the first thing we have to do. Do you remember what it was? Hear the word of God. Yes, hear the word of God. Use your ears. Jesus said, listen, but then he said what? Do not merely listen. So he said, the man who looks intently. So that's one way to get blessed. That's reading the Bible. Then he says, continues to do this. That's reviewing the Bible. Then he says, not forgetting what he's heard. So that's remembering the Bible, but doing it. And that's responding to the Bible. If you do those things, it says he will be blessed in what he does. So that's um, reading, reviewing, remembering, and responding. And to be blessed, we need to do all of those. So real quickly this morning, we're just going to briefly touch on each one of those. Okay, but then we'll come back later in this sermon series that we're starting today called Grow Deep, Learning to Love, Learn, and Live Out God's Word. We'll come back in this series, and we'll unpack each of these much more deeply, much deeper, whichever way you prefer. First, it says, the person who looks intently. We already said, looks intently is referring to reading the Bible. But when I read the Bible, this is not a speed reading contest. This is not, how many verses can you read in four minutes or less? Go! Go! This is a time to relax, have your coffee or your favorite beverage with you, and you read the scripture, and you reflect on it, and you ponder it, and you do not feel 
crushed. And scripture says that, that when a person does this, it's kind of like looking in a mirror. So the Bible is compared to a mirror, so that causes us to step back and ask the question, what is the purpose of a mirror? The purpose of a mirror is self-evaluation. We use the mirror to evaluate ourselves, and so the Bible helps us to do that. And I would imagine every one of you did this before you left your house today, I would guess. I would imagine before you stepped through the door to leave your house, you probably paused and looked at the mirror and took in the damage from last night. And then you evaluated if anything needed to be changed before you presented yourself in public. So maybe you ran a brush through your hair. I hope you ran a brush through your teeth. Maybe you had to wash your face. Maybe you needed to put a little makeup on. Uh, but you evaluated what you saw. Maybe you made some changes and then made your way to church. Now, maybe you never thought about this, but there are actually two different ways to use a mirror. Well, there are a lot of ways to use the mirror, but to look in a mirror. You can glance at the mirror, or you can gaze into the mirror. Now, this idea of glancing into the mirror took me back to my uh, childhood when I used to watch a show you may have heard of called Happy Days. How many of you remember Happy Days? How many of you remember Fonzie? And Fonzie, if he'd walk past the mirror, he'd pull out his comb, right? He'd look, he'd look in the mirror and go, hey. He didn't have to do anything because he was the picture of perfection, apparently, right? But we do not want to do that. That's glancing, right? That's a quick glance. We do not want to do that when it comes to this mirror, the mirror of God's word. You can't just glance at the word of God. You have to, you have to gaze into it and look for the details. Glancing is like this, that quick, um, Lord, I've got two minutes. I'm going to look at it really quick and then on with my day and I can check it off my to-do list. But when you gaze at it, again, that's when you look intently. You, you look at the details. You ask questions. Now, during the remainder of this sermon series, I will recommend some Bible reading plans. And again, just a recommendation, and hopefully you'll be able to find one that meets you where you are. That's the important thing, right? Um, there are so many different Bible reading plans. Sometimes it's overwhelming. You don't know where to start. So I'll put together a list of some different resources that hopefully you'll be able to find one that fits you where you're at. What I don't recommend is what my pastor friends and I often refer to as the skip and dip. How many of you know what the skip and dip is? That's when you just open your Bible at a random spot and you go, um. And Judas went out and hung himself. Um. Go thou and do likewise. I do not recommend the skip and dip method. You do not get good direction in that method. What you need is a plan, right? So that you're methodically working your way through all of God's word over a period of time. So you receive God's word with my ear. I read God's word with my eyes. That's the first two. Number three, I research God's word with my hands. And by that, we're simply talking about Bible study actually studying the Bible. And many people will say, well, Jeff, is there really that big of a difference between reading the Bible and studying the Bible? And there really is. Reading the Bible is, well, reading the Bible. But studying the Bible is an active process where, in fact, I would say if you don't have a pen and paper in hand and maybe a highlighter, you're not really studying the Bible, because, because once you start that process, you're going to have questions, you're going to have observations, you're going to want to make notes and um, make connections, and if you're, if you're comfortable highlighting and underlining in your Bible, you'll, you'll probably want to do that to help you, um, and so there's a big difference between reading your Bible and studying your Bible. 
I write down what I learn, and I write down questions as I study. Number four, the fourth way to build your life on the Bible. I review and remember the Bible with my mind. I review and remember the Word of God with my mind. Let's look at James again. The man who looks intently, so we said looks intently is reading, into the perfect law and continues to do this, so that's reviewing, continues to do this is reviewing, not forgetting, so that's remembering, he will be blessed in what he does. So if you want to be blessed in what you do, you've got to learn how to review and remember God's word with your mind. So what's this idea of review? In other words, you're continually thinking about it. You're pondering it over and over. You're remembering it. You're not forgetting it. In fact, I would say if you're serious about growing deeper in your faith and understanding of who God is and his love for you, then the number one habit you should develop is the habit of memorizing Scripture. You hide the word of God in your heart by keeping it in your mind. And I will confess to you that there have been times in my life, and I'm sure many of you have had the exact same situation, where you were so depleted, whether it was physically or emotionally, that you didn't have what it took to even reach over to the shelf and grab your Bible and open it, even though it was four feet away. But when you have God's word hidden in your heart, when you have verses that you've memorized that you say over and over again, you can find comfort in the word of God when it's hidden in your mind. How many of you have verses that when times get tough, you, they, they come to mind and you just say them and say them and say them? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. You just have those hidden in your heart. But if I haven't done that, if I haven't memorized and put his word in my heart, it kind of brings us back to the image of home builder dude number two whose house kind of fell apart, right? There's one more way to build my life on the Bible. I respond to it with my actions. That's the fifth thing from this, this, thing that, this verse that James shares with us to do. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Remember we said before I went on vacation, we talked about how um, knowing isn't enough, right? It's the doing that makes all the difference. It's the doing that makes all the difference. But this verse says that you can deceive yourselves. Well, how do we deceive ourselves? Wives, you know the answer to this. Because you've told your husband something, and he said, I got it. And then he forgot it. We deceive ourselves by thinking, I heard it, so I got it. I heard it, so I got it. But that's not true. We can have a great conversation and, and talk about how to become a better father. But if we don't do what we talked about, we're deceiving ourselves. It's the doing that makes the difference. I could explain how to build an amazing financial budget on the principles you find in God's word. But if we don't actually do it, we're deceiving ourselves. It's the doing that makes the difference. Let's go back to the story we started with, where Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount with the story of the dudes. Matthew 7, 24. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, in other words, you're a doer, the doing makes all the difference, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the storms rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet, it did not fall. I bet he had a party after that, don't you? It's still standing, yes. 
But everyone who hears these words of mine, you come to church, you listen, you hear, but we don't put it into practice. Everyone who hears these words of mine but does not do them is like a foolish man who builds his house on sand. The rain came down, the storms, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And friends, with all my heart, I do not want that to be you. Storms will come into your life. Storms will come into my life. And if we don't have the foundation of our very existence planted solidly upon God's unchanging, life-improving word, we may just fall apart. So the solid foundation for your life, again, cannot be the opinions of others, whether those are others in your sphere of influence or others you respect on TV or prevailing culture. All of this is shifting sand. We must build our lives on the unchanging truth of God's word. It was true a thousand years ago. It will be just as true a thousand years from now. Basic building blocks for today. Build your life on the solid rock of God's word. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we cannot begin to express our thanks and our gratitude for giving us this book that we call the Bible. This book that serves as a roadmap through this crazy world. This book that is filled with so many promises, so many words of encouragement, so many Words that bring joy to the soul and a smile to the heart. Lord, we pray for those who have tried and tried and tried to read your word, but for some reason it just hasn't clicked. It just hasn't excited them. Lord, I pray that you would begin to work in our lives in such a way that we would begin to absorb your word in ways we have never before. May your word spring to life as we commit to reading it daily and listening for your guidance. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name.